Hey friends, welcome in. How is accounting going for you? <laughs> How is running a firm, being a leader in an accounting firm? Uh, this video is gonna be different. This is gonna be a little more long form, not optimized for retention. I have a ton of people are gonna drop off. That's totally fine. What I want this video to be is uh, asking some of some of the bigger picture questions. For me, the biggest, most transformational things that I ever went through as an accountant were the things that shifted my mindset to something totally different, to a totally different paradigm, to like blowing the doors off some assumption that I had that had been limiting me for years. Because the reality is like, most of what is holding us back and keeping us from being happy and fulfilled and successful and all those things is we are stuck on certain assumptions that we don't realize we can push through, that we can kick the door down on. And a lot of people out there now sharing their journey about firm running, which I love in totally different ways from building an accounting firm, you know, that's completely virtual, which 20 years ago was like, are you kidding me? to uh, building an accounting firm that doesn't take phone calls because you despise phone calls. I'm loving seeing people challenging these assumptions more and more that a professional services firm doesn't have to be what professional services service firms have been for like the last century, right? Like how are we leaning into the internet, into the reach that we now have on social media to build a different, better kind of professional services firm? So I'm gonna run you through these 14 questions this is gonna be a longer one. We may actually save the next few for the podcast tomorrow. Okay, number one. How could you run your firm or your role in your firm, if you're you know, a senior or a manager, in two hours per week? Yeah, I get that. That's, that's ridiculous. That's extreme, right? But I think when you go to that level of extreme, it makes you laser focused on what would I do have to do to just keep my business alive or to just keep like things at the minimum kind of operational level? So a few things to think about there as you're narrowing down, oh my gosh, here's what I do in 40 hours a week or 60 hours or 80 hours a week. How do I get that down to two hours per week? That seems ridiculous. Number one, what would you do with that time? So of the 40 hours, the however many hours you're gonna spend in this next week, what are the two hours that you could not imagine cross-training somebody else on or hiring somebody else for or picking up a piece of software to streamline or, or something like that? There's gonna be a lot of things in that block of time that are really hard to imagine giving away how you ever get out from under that work. But more than anything else, what are the, what's the two hours of work that you couldn't imagine getting rid of? And what you'll find is actually, and this was the case for me, for me that two hours ultimately goes into the people that I have around me. Because systems that are reliant upon me, like that is just where, that's where my business goes to die, like that's where it's always gonna be hung up on me and I'm always going to be the bottleneck. So the more I like reduce, the more I think about reducing the time I spend on my projects, the more my focus goes to how do I focus on what's most important but also how do I pull in other talented people to keep carrying the torch, whether I'm there or not? So that's the second thing to think about in this question. What responsibilities of others would change? If you had to do this tomorrow, who's the person that you're gonna sit down right away and be like, listen, this is gonna be a lot for you, but I'm gonna throw you X, Y, and Z. That You probably have that person. Even if you're a solo firm runner, who is that person you've been thinking about? Maybe you've been thinking about making an admin hire. Maybe you've been thinking about hiring a, a VA for the first time, but you just haven't. If you had to do that tomorrow, how would the responsibilities of the other people around you change? Think about that. What would they do differently? What would you be asking of them? And then think about why couldn't you do that? Like what's, what is stopping you from doing that? I know in my experience, I was too slow to put stuff on the other folks in my team. And they were at their worst when I wasn't giving them a clear expectation of what to do and then trusting them to do it well. Like when I cut people loose, like when I gave them clear instructions and trusted them and, and gave them that freedom, that was when those people were at their best. And that was when I was perpetually most impressed with what they did was when they had that freedom. So for, if you're me, I always underestimated exactly how much I could, I could get people to help with, how much I could ask of other people because 
It turned out most of the folks that worked for me were hungry to take on more of that stuff and the blocker was me. The blocker was me clinging to those things thinking nobody's going to do this as well as I do it. And that's just, that's the trap, right? And then third thing to think about under there, if you only had two hours per week, what expectations of clients would need to be changed? So specifically on the client facing side, if there's people that rely on you right now, or if there's a you know turnaround time or, or some demand of clients that would fundamentally break if you only had two hours per week, what expectations would need to be changed and how could you change them? Is that something that you could, that you could still do? Taking this to the super extreme here, I think is, is really helpful because it puts in perspective a lot of the fringe stuff that we don't just make time to delegate or make time to change. Okay, question number two. What would I have to do to not open email the next six weeks? Noticing a trend here, uh, another, another extreme one. Okay, imagine, imagine that nirvana. You're not gonna open your email inbox for another six weeks. This is frankly unimaginable on the surface, probably. Like this, this seems wildly difficult, but the more you drill into it, you totally could do this. You absolutely could. In fact, what if you did? What if you just gave this a try? You didn't open it for six weeks. Not that you're necessarily gonna leave or go anywhere, but what if, what if you did? So a few thoughts around this whole not opening your email in the next six weeks. Hopefully all of these thoughts and these ideas and possibly these experience experiments get you closer to uh, a place of, of freedom and sustainability in managing this stuff. First thought, what would you have to put in place for your business to still work? I had largely worked myself out of the client work within my firm, but there's still a lot of really important stuff I was doing day to day. And oftentimes if it landed in my email inbox, it was because we hadn't yet taken the time to designate a subject matter expert for that thing or make it somebody else's job. If you have people working for you and there's still stuff coming to you, kind of the implicit assumption then has to be, well, you're the only one in the business that could have done that thing. And that's usually not the case. Usually it's coming to you because you swooped in and you were the hero last time. Uh, maybe you were the path of least resistance to getting that thing done. But if you did not open that inbox for another six weeks, what would you have to put in place? Probably gonna have to pull somebody in to help out on that inbox, right? So. If that was something you've been meaning to do or something you wanted to experiment with, getting somebody to help out on that inbox, what's stopping you from ripping that Band-Aid, giving it a try? You'd probably have to have some communications with clients about having to talk with somebody different than maybe they usually do. Second consideration under there, why couldn't you do that without going away? Uh, so this is hot take. You're probably not planning on going vacation in the next six weeks, at least if you're in the US, the beginning of the year and taxis and all that stuff, uh, super hairy. But what if you just kept working, kept doing your thing, worked on the stuff that you wanted to work on, but didn't open your email inbox for the next six weeks? Why couldn't you do that? So some of those responses might look like, a lot of clients sent us really imp important information over email that we need to get the work done, great. Is there an admin that you could pull in and fetch those documents? Like you don't need to be the one pulling all those documents. Maybe all the new sales leads, you know, from, from the website come into you. Is there a, you know, scoring process that your team could help out with to filter out a whole bunch of those things? And if, if they really need you for that sales meeting, put it on your calendar, but you don't need to manage the fuss of emailing with the client and going through leads and all that stuff. What are all the reasons why that wouldn't work without you going away? Probably a bunch of things we could eliminate there, right? Uh, this whole, you know, X number of questions, uh, this is kind of inspired from a thing that Tim Ferriss did, 17 questions that changed my life. Uh, that's what it's called. I'll put a link to it in the video description. He had an awesome quote in here. Uh, basically, systems outlive vacations. So are you putting everything on your back? Are you doing everything yourself or are you building systems that will outlive you, that will keep working whether you're there or not? This is a tricky one for many of us because we derive our, our joy in what we do from, from doing the work and working with the clients. But a lot of us are also at our wits end where we're like, how am I gonna do this? Is this really sustainable for another decade? Systems outlive vacations, I love that one. Third question, what if I let my team this applies to you if you are an owner, if you're a manager. What if I let my team manage accounts up to a certain size threshold? What if I didn't have to stick my nose into any accounts that were under, pick a number, a thousand bucks a year, 10,000 bucks a year. 
why do you have to be involved in the simplest of the projects that are happening within your firm? Usually, the issue is we dwell on edge cases that are problematic, like a, a client getting upset or something like that, and you need to be there to save the day and to smooth things over, when in reality, these are like outliers, kind of these, these edge cases that are not the norm, and even then, like it creates some issues also when you swoop in to be the hero, but we end up interjecting ourselves into a process to handle the edge case rather than enabling your team the people around you to manage the stuff that you you really probably don't need to have your nose into. And as a result of letting go of those small things, those smaller projects, it brings into focus the big stuff, the stuff you really need to be working on. Maybe that's the larger clients, maybe that's more strategic projects, maybe that's putting out content to find better clients. Is there a dollar threshold where you can totally remove yourself? And maybe dollar isn't the right metric, but like, is there, is there some demographic of those projects or cross section of them to where you don't even need to be involved in that ongoing work? Maybe even in sales work, you know, for potential new clients below a certain size. Is that something that you can pull the team in on? And so like the goal of this is to explore, what if you did that? What are the potential downsides? And do they outweigh, outweigh the potential upsides and even like, what does a partial success look like here? Is that taking us in a positive direction? I think the answer is usually yes, because you're enabling your people to do more than they've ever done before. And we are usually the blockers of our people. Question number four is a great one. What are the worst things that could happen and how could I recover from them? So Tim Ferriss has this, this fear setting framework. And we did this a couple of weeks ago on my podcast. It's an exercise where you go through and you basically journal, what are all the worst possible things that could happen? What are the things that you're afraid of? Um, how can we prevent them? And how can we mitigate them if they did come to happen? And the really helpful thing about this fear setting framework is when we're not explicit about the things that we are afraid of, they're all kind of like ambiguously, I don't know, lingering over you and causing this sort of like baseline level of anxiety. But when we stop to put them under a microscope, we see that many of them are unfounded and the ones that are founded can be managed. But until we take the time to stop and acknowledge what those things are, they're just kind of hovering over you. They are like sucking the joy out of your days. And I've, I have always struggled with this. It doesn't matter what level of, of success or what whatever thing you're doing, like human nature is to um, worry, oftentimes about things outside our control, but we oftentimes don't stop to assess the validity of those worries. So what are the very worst things that could happen and how could you recover from them? Um, in accounting firms, that's you know things like losing key people who are part of the business, losing uh, you know reputation. If you increase prices, what if you get review bombed on Google reviews or something like that? What are the worst case scenarios? How can we prevent them? And if they do happen, how can we mitigate them? The more explicit we are about those bad things that could happen, the less scary they are. And rather than losing sleep over kind of the ambiguity of those things, we can actually put together a, a meaningful plan. Because if these are, and it's, this isn't to diminish these fears, because these, many of these fears have legitimate things that we need to be thinking about, it is making a more concrete plan to actually do something about them. Because just worrying about them is only serving to keep you from getting done what you actually want to get done and not actually getting you any closer to a solution, right? If you struggle with this, I super recommend that fear setting framework. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Super helpful exercise to do like on a monthly basis. This is a quote, I think I think it was Newt Gingrich. Uh, Are you chasing field mice or antelope? And so the analogy here is a lion could, is perfectly capable of, capable of catching field mouse, field mice and eating them, which is pretty impressive, but the calories they expend catching mice isn't worth the amount of effort that goes into catching them. As opposed to, you catch an antelope, you are like feeding the whole family for weeks. And this is uh, the planet Earth equivalent of my walking past a hundred dollar bill on the sidewalk analogy. There are so many, so many hundred dollar bills on the sidewalk that we have to walk by every single day that are traps that are trying to take our attention, that are easy money, but that are ultimately field mice, not antelopes. A lion can live a long and happy life only bothering with the antelopes. So why would they bother with anything else, right? Like 
Man, like that rings so true for like small accounting firms where 80% of the clients account for 20% of the revenue and 90% of the headaches. But we really struggle with detaching ourselves from them and, and moving on from those relationships when that top 20% reality is, is, is going to take you to a place that like you couldn't even imagine right now and probably get you into new clients that you can help even more. But because we're not willing to detach ourselves from what we used to do, we're not able to like fully realize that next thing for ourselves because right now it's unknowable because we can't see over that next hill yet, right? And so what you end up doing is juggling all of these field mice while you have a few antelopes you're really proud of trying to keep happy but the field mice never go away. Or you try to hire a bunch of people to manage the field mice, and how does that go? You end up getting sucked into that stuff, and now you're just spending all your time managing people uh, instead of like actually focusing on that next thing that's gonna take you to something even better. So are you focusing on the field mice or the antelope? I think we're on number six now. My numbers got mixed up. Number six, how could you sell what you do without ever getting in front of prospective customers? So for most of us right now, you get like a, a lead and you hop on a Zoom, do a discovery call, something like that. But what would it look like to attract people and close sales without ever getting in front of them? That's not to say you do this, but it's a really interesting thought experiment. Because if you remove yourself from the process directly, like in a one-on-one -on -one live sort of setting, you start thinking about like, okay, what are all the assets that I can build that will attract people? to my firm, right? If I can't get on a meeting with them live, if I am untouchable, how do I attract them to what I do? Something I've adopted in my life now that super um, leans into leverage is I fundamentally do not do one-on-one -on -one meetings. Like I get DMs every day from folks asking for help with this or that, from accountants to uh, software people and all of that. And I could do that stuff and I could be on those meetings all day. Instead, what I do is I say everything that I put out, I put out publicly for everyone to benefit from. And so if you have a question that you're willing to send to me privately or, or publicly, that you're okay with being answered in a public forum, happy to tackle it. But basically I do my consulting for free where everybody can see it. And for me, that's the most high leverage way that I can do what I do. But if we think about how we run accounting firms, it is the same way people ran accounting firms 100 years ago. Uh, most accounting firms, your revenue was 100% one-on-one -on -one work for people and small businesses. It is 0% product sales or selling one to many things like leading a mastermind of, of 10 people and everybody paying to be in that mastermind or something like that. So this question of how could you sell what you do without getting in front of your customers, I think takes your mind to a place of how do I build higher leverage assets and stuff that will work while I sleep? Because if our goal going out and starting our own firm is to stop trading time for money and to own the thing that we're working on, yet when you get sick, nothing happens or the team's incapable of operating on their own or if you're a solo practice, no work gets done because you're the only one doing the work. Buddy, you're still trading your time for money. You're probably getting more money for your time but you haven't truly escaped that. So a helpful exercise here as you're thinking about getting to a more specific type of customer who will pay you more for the work that you already do is how, what assets could you put out there that will attract those people to your firm and make them ready to sign the engagement letter without you ever having to take a live meeting with them. Number seven, uh, on this same topic, what if you taught your clients everything that you know? How? This is, this is the important part of the question. How would you do it? Um, I would super encourage people to not be afraid of giving away too much in a tweet or a blog post or anything like that, like holding back. There's this notion that we need to hold back our professional expertise rather than just give it away because we have all these people paying us for our professional expertise. Buddy, if your clients were a tweet or a blog post or a LinkedIn post away from being able to do your job, like that's just not the case. My clients are not a not a tweet away from being able to close their own books, from being able to do their own tax return. We don't have to worry about that. And the framing most people use is, is they will give their expertise out generally anywhere, but 
the folks who are paying you that that uh, have engaged you, they're getting your expertise specifically through the lens of their circumstances. And that's that's totally legit because there's no such thing as one size fits all advice. But if you take all the stuff that you know and you wanted to teach it to your clients, how would you do it? Would that be turning up on social media every day? Would that be a YouTube channel? Would that be uh, a weekly newsletter where you taught them something, a little bit of something every single week? Would that be like a course that you sold? What is the best way for that medicine to go down? And what's stopping you from doing it? Like, why not? Um, on my podcast, we've been talking a lot about how we already have the information in our heads to, to write a book, to write a, any number of social media posts, blog posts, all these things, because we sit here answering questions all day, every single day. And we've seen all the things that people get wrong and we know the traps and we could talk about this stuff until the end of time because it's just what we do all day, every day. The problem is it is all trapped up in here. So you have all the information to do these things that will, that will lead to uh, finding clients when you sleep, like writing books and a YouTube channel, whatever. Uh, the problem is it's all up here. That information is not yet in the right format, right? Like you have enough stuff in your head to write a book. Think about the number of questions you answer every single week. That can be a book. Organize that into the most common questions for a certain type of person. There's your book. You have all the information up there already. It is just not organized in the right format. And so if you were looking to educate people on what you knew, how would you do it? There's tremendous value in putting that stuff out there by giving, uh, giving away tremendous amounts of value and expecting for everything else to work itself out, right? I mean, this is a video I'm putting out. The video doesn't have a sponsor on it. You don't make ad sense on YouTube videos like this that'll get, you know, a thousand views. I am trusting that the world is big enough and that there's enough people on the other side of the camera to benefit from this, that ultimately it's all gonna work itself out. And I can tell you, it, like for me, it absolutely has. Being helpful, just focusing on that and being present every day online, talking to a very specific type of person, people who run and lead small accounting firms. That is all you need to do these days and like the opportunities take care of themselves. Let's do two more. Number eight, what would it look like if this were easy? If all of this were easy, think about all the stuff you got on the docket this week. What would it look like if it were easy? Would that look like having like the assistant of your dreams that you could just chuck stuff at and they just know what to do with it? Would that be your client's not calling you? Would that be getting fewer emails? Would that be finally having that unicorn tax person who can take the technical reviews off your plate? Would it be finding three more people to get the work done? Would it be having a, a social media person that was just magic and they could put great content out all the time to just bring you this nonstop flow of new clients? What would it look like if it were easy? And what's what are you doing to invest in, in getting too easy, right? Like what are, what are kind of some of the seeds you need to start planting now that will take you a step closer to that? Because that might lead you to number nine, what if all you could do to solve your problems was to subtract rather than add, right? I think default for us is we're growing, we're doing more, so we're going to add. We're gonna add more people and add more service offerings and learn this new piece of software. But what if the only way that you could solve that problem was to subtract? What would you subtract? Would you subtract doing certain types of work? Maybe I don't wanna to touch payroll anymore. Would I subtract certain types of clients that maybe I'm not a great fit for anymore? Would I sub subtract expectations from the engagement? Here's the stuff that we used to do, but going forward, we're only gonna do this part. Or I know in the past, I've always emailed you back same day, Realistically going forward, that's gonna be like three days. Or I know I gave you my cell phone number, you're not allowed to use it anymore. If you have a problem, like think about a very specific problem, how could you solve that problem only by subtracting rather than adding? It depends on what your goals are in all of this stuff. When I was in my 20s, uh, my goal was grow like heck, add a bunch of clients, like push these big impressive revenue numbers and build a big team. And that was what my, that was like the paradigm of success. Like that was the default path. That was what I was plugged into and excited about. And I did that and it was probably the least fun years of my life. 
and everybody's gonna be different here. For me personally, the most fun I ever had was when I was subtracting, was when we were reducing client headcount, but actually maintaining revenue and increasing profit. When we actually reduced staff headcount a bit, where we had made a bunch of hires and we were growing really quickly and uh, the bar for the type of person that we would hire, we kind of had to let slip a little bit because we just had to get the work done and that created a ton of headaches. On the other side of that, when we reduced and subtracted, the people who were left were the people I loved working with, who were so good at their jobs. And to turn up every single day with the people I was most excited to work with, with the clients I most enjoyed working on, that was such a better place to be when I was subtracting rather than adding. I'm gonna put a worksheet in the video description for all the questions I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna go through five more on my podcast tomorrow. If you like this long form format, this is what we do on the podcast. It's more just like talking shop about firm running. I'll run through the rest of those tomorrow, but I'll put a worksheet down below for you to get all of these. If you work with a partner or if you have a, another decision maker in your firm where you're not always in alignment, I would also recommend going through this worksheet independently on your own and then coming together and sharing what your answers were to these questions. Not to necessarily get into alignment, but to understand where both you and your partner or this other decision maker is at. Because zooming out and asking these harder questions and thinking more intentionally about why are we doing what we're doing, oftentimes that leads to pushing past like the biggest assumptions that you might be stuck on. Thanks for coming and hanging today. Uh, if it's after tomorrow, I'll post the podcast for the last five right up here and I'll see you there.